Jim muted. Jim muted. Okay. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. Um, I'm figuring out how to chat with y'all, so that's pretty cool. Uh, my name is Olup Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. Um, yeah, so happy Friday, everybody. Uh, we've got a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to hop into a conversation with Che. So let's see. First thing is we um, have our community event that's running today, uh, running this month, which is Mindful Mayhem. Um, and it's a good opportunity for y'all to practice mindfulness, earn XP, win rewards, and whatnot. So a couple things. Uh, we've done a few um, community events here at HG. And, and you know, we, like, we do things like make YouTube videos and stream and all that good stuff. And we teach y'all about mental health. But at some point, y'all have to start doing something. So some people will do stuff like, um, you know, we've got exercises and stuff in Dr. K's guide. Uh, some people will do things like sign up for coaching. I've seen a lot of stuff today because it's like um, dating Friday on our subreddit. And people are like, you know, I, I have difficulty socializing. So group coaching and stuff like that really helps for that sort of thing. Helps you build emotional awareness. Um, helps you like practice communication. Helps you practice listening. Helps you do things like... Uh, how do you jump into a conversation? When is it your turn to speak? So a lot of people have this problem where they kind of like, you're in a conversation, but you don't know like when you're supposed to speak. And you have something useful to say, but then it's like that window passes. And once the window passes, it's like, well, now I don't have anything useful to say. Like, I don't have anything good to say. I had a good thing to say. Like, I had a good joke. I had a good anecdote. But like, now the window has passed and I can't reverse the conversation. So if you really think about it, what we're seeing in society is a social skills atrophy, right? Because we don't practice these things because we can communicate so much online. And the cool thing is it's a, such a common thing in, in group coaching where people are like, when is it my turn to speak? Like, how do I break into a conversation? How do I give each other space? How do I claim the space that I have or I'm supposed to have? Um and so you can kind of learn all those sorts of skills there. And it's really fascinating because when I hear about people dating, like, it sounds like people, it's hard for people to talk, like people don't know how to talk. So we sometimes have stuff like that. Um, but the other thing that we have is our community events. And so Mindful Mayhem is a photo challenge where you're going to go out and you're going to do stuff, chat. And we're going to do things like practice box breathing, make your bed, right? We got to start small, chat. Burn a scented candle. Okay, this person is just uploading all of the pictures and it's racking up all of the points. Brew a cup of tea or coffee. Make your bed. Nice. Um, complete a resource pack. Okay, complete another one. Make your bed. Okay, a lot of people... Wait, that's the same picture. Someone is cheating. Gastronaut has discovered a hack, chat. Um, set three goals for the day. Awesome. Complete... Uh, write, uh, write th three things you like about yourself. So like this is all this stuff where eat some fruit. Like if we talk about being healthy, right? If we, we're like, okay, we're going to try to be healthy. There's like watching YouTube videos about being healthy, which we are pleased that y'all do. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all that kind of stuff. But then there's the actual part of being healthy. Which is really interesting, actually, for a second, because there's some evidence that language can substitute for action when it comes to progress and change, which is crazy. But there's there's data behind that. But this is just a way to encourage you all to start doing those things that you always want to do. So check out Mindful Mayhem. Um, and then last thing that we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you can type uh, exclamation point mindful in chat to join. Um, and then... Last thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to introduce our epic guest today. So hold on a second. I got to do this. I got to do this. Okay. I got to make sure that things aren't muted. Okay. Hold on, chat. I'll figure this out eventually. We're going to do this. Then we're going to go here. And so we have the awesome Che Dorena epic comedian um, and we're going to watch like two of his clips and then we'll hop into the interview okay 
Yo, this is so fucking titillating. Watching a guy craft his bed like he's painting the sequel to the Mona Lisa. All I can think is, what a fucking waste of time. He's putting hours into something that he's he's gonna fart in later. He's gonna fart, he might chart by accident. Foam, you fucking idiots. Yo, this is so... Okay. <laughs> we measure our dicks inaccurately. Now hear me out, okay? Usually we measure from base to tip and usually from the base of the bottom, not the base of the top. Nothing but hurt feelings up there, okay? But the, that is only a measure of length where girth is arguably just as, if not more, important. So without having to like do complex Cat. math to figure out their this circumference and the diameter of a dingus, like we should just what be is... measuring dick size by volume. And we simply fill up a glass full of fucking water. You put your shit right in it. And the amount of fucking water the that reveal. gets displaced out of the cup Still is full. your size. The more water that gets displaced, the bigger your shit. Okay. Well, this should be interesting. Comedy chat. All right, let's hop in with Che. Um, let me do this. Okay, I'm going to click this button. I'm going to pop out this chat. I'm going to go down here. And we're going to do this. And we're going to make sure that this works and it works. And now we're just waiting for Che. So this should be interesting. Volumetric comparisons. Absolutely, dude. Um, it is. So I think it's against both YouTube and Twitch's terms of service to live stream simultaneously on both platforms. Uh, it, it appears that Che is a man of science. Um, and it appears he is AFK. GG chat. So we're just going to vibe for a little while. While we're waiting. Oh, no. Oh, no, chat. Um, how are y'all doing today? Let me see if we can do this while we're waiting. He's not here, right? No. Okay. Please adopt what, chat? AI Dr. K on Twitch? Do y'all want an AI Dr. K? Would that be good? Uh-oh. Good or bad? How's this? Hello. I am AI Dr. K. <laughs> uh oh, this says Ludwig. <laughs> All right. GG. Um, interviewer name. Interviewee. Fixed it. Oh, but Che is not here. GG. So we'll we'll have AI conversation with Dr. K. Hello, Dr. K. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Dr. K? I'm doing well. This is odd. Are you planning on on? Are you gonna stream like this the whole time? Would you guys like me to have a conversation with myself? Okay. While we're waiting for Che, I guess what we're gonna do is have a conversation with ourselves. Um, so what we can do is you guys give us conversational topics and we will, we will, uh, we will go ahead and talk about them. So what's, what's the topic? Hey, Dr. K, were you born and raised in India? So my soul was born in India, but I was actually technically born in the great nation of Texas. And 
that is, yeah. And I grew up there. And then I discovered barbecue. And so now I am no longer in India. Great question. <laughs> no, but seriously, the, the, the Dr. Cock Alanoja, have you all seen those videos? Those are great. These are epic. I don't know if people are still making them. Um, let's see. There's a compilation video. If I Okay, let's do it. You guys want to watch more videos of Che? Let's do that while we're waiting. Because who needs the real thing when we have a YouTube video? Um, I was told that I should watch this if I'm feeling brave. So what do you... <laughs> okay, chat. Do we watch this or not watch this? Kiss him. Okay, you guys want to know what's actually really profound? This is actually really profound. This is wild. So. I have to kiss over here. Oh, no! Jay can't handle it. He can't handle it, chat. He can't handle it. <laughs> Discord can't... Dude, I swear. Sometimes the internet won't let us do things. Have y'all noticed this? That, like, the universe, like, Twitch's servers, YouTube servers, my ISP, right? It's haram. Amex is saying, like, they, they can't, they can't handle it. Like, we were about to, you know, it broke. Seriously, like, Discord was, like, someone's, like, someone's sitting there in Discord, like, monitoring everything, and they've got the kill switch, and they're, like, hit the kill switch. All right, let's see what's happening. Mm. You're just getting spinning dots. Okay, let's troubleshoot. I can't hear you, but let's make sure that it's not us, first of all. Um, so let, we're gonna do we're, we're gonna do a tech support check. So let me just do this first. Um, input device, output device. Okay, I think that works. Um, and then... Che, can you hear me? I know we're sitting in the call. We're going to do tech support. I can't see or hear you. Okay. Click on the... I'm going to screen share. Um... Hold on. I got to figure out how to do this. Okay. Click on the... Let me do this. Let's pop this back in. And then we're going to screen share. Okay. So now we're going to click this. Wait, does that work? Yeah. Okay. Click this, and then select the right camera, whichever one it is. And then click this. Okay. Um. Hmm. Okay. Bottom, there should be mic icon. Click the mic icon. And then select, and then make sure that the right audio input and output are selected. Second thing is make sure your camera is not being pulled by something else. You can select the camera icon and make sure you have the right cam. Um, with me, chat, we're going to do in, doing some tech support.
you see the can you see my screen share We're just doing tech support now. Um, am I a tech support wizard? I'm a tech support warlock. Uh, either need a virtual cam or you have to start Discord first. Did y'all know that? That you have to start Discord before you start streaming sometimes, depending on your camera setup? Oh my god, you are right. This is why it is not working, chat. Oh my goodness. I'm not using the right, I've I've equipped the wrong accent. And now that the accent is equipped properly, the check support will work. DM, can I re-roll? Can I re check, recheck? Can I recheck? Can I roll again? Can I try again with the right accent equipped? Or do I need to level up first? Did you know that normally you need to level up before you check again? This is the, you want to know problem in life, everyone? If you are interested in dating, 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 what you need to do is level up before you recheck. The problem is right now we are checking, we will ask someone out and we will fail the check, no? Isn't it? Then what happens is we go and we ask again and then we fail again. You must level up before you recheck. Otherwise, the D20 roll from the past will work this time. Isn't it? Barbara Jagoda is saying, I love how I can't understand him. That is because I am failing my communication check. Isn't it? See? Do you see? And even now I am talking and you cannot understand. Looks like Chai is still here. But we'll see. Do y'all play D&D? 90% more head bobble. The bobble is there. It is there. You can't just bobble all the time. Otherwise, you will get a, a repetitive stress injury, RSI. Normal times, we are talking about carpal tunnel. But you can get RSI at the base of the occiput. That is from the head bobble injury. Because these, these, your paraspinal muscles and the ones that insert into the back of the occiput, these are the ones you have to be careful about their RSI, repetitive stress injury. Okay, we can talk to Sadhguru, but I think maybe he will be offended, no? Can't talk to him in an accent, you know, oh my God. <laughs> Ninja2 saying, I like other RPG systems better. Which RPG system is superior? Please let us know. I burn my finger and I can't do anything except hold an ice pack for hours. You got to be careful about holding ice packs too long, dude. You could get an injury from that. Okay, Che's back. Let's see. Just shared your screen. Wow, it's not working. Let me see. Nope. Okay, let's focus on audio and I can walk you through video if you can hear me instead of me typing. Order of operations. You wanna know one thing I learned in, in medical school? You gotta th do things in the right order. You gotta do a physical ex exam before a CT scan. Right? Um, using the right audio device. We like checked this just before. Um, I hope it's not me. You 
can try doing a full screen share instead of Um, can he hear you type? Can y'all hear me type? <laughs> Do you like this? So, so this is actually really cool. I don't know if you guys um, know Tomination Time, but when I first started streaming, Tomination Time was really, really helpful. And he actually like, he has this great website that has like all of his streaming set up. And he also recommended like this Kinesis gaming keyboard. And the thing that I love the most about the Kinesis gaming keyboard, this is not sponsored by Kinesis, but I guess they should be is that I don't know if y'all write, but I, I I try to write, so I write a lot, right? So, and then what's cool about writing is um, I can't hear myself when I test for some reason. Uh, hmm. Are your speakers on? Weird. Um, yeah, Tom, and, and so so this is great actually because I can like, I can move it. So I, you know, you shouldn't write like this. This little, this little like, I, my wife has this Apple keyboard and she like types like this all day, because it's like this tiny little cute keyboard. And so she's got this ulnar deviation at the wrist all the time. And and instead, what's cool is like if you're you know like a like a command command chair, where your arms are like this and you can type. Um, they're on. Okay. You can hear other sound. Like you, YouTube. Hmm. Let me see. Try screen sharing if you don't mind. Chad position. Thumb clusters. What is a thumb cluster? That sounds. That sounds, uh. Do you recommend it as a doctor, though? I mean, it's probably good. Or I, like, I think it's good ergonomically, but I'm not an expert in, like, ergonomics. I do some of the yoga, as you know. But I, I would have to really do a little bit of research before I could recommend something as a doctor. Did you know that four out of five dentists <laughs> recommend this keyboard? Is Che coming? Well, he's... he's... Y'all ready for it? He's trying to come. He's just having some difficulty. And I'm trying to give him a hand. Okay, you're screen sharing now. I can hear YouTube. Okay, weird. I don't see a screen share. Um, and you have the right input devices selected for audio and speakers. I mean, come on, chat. Y'all, y'all teed me up for that one. That was not like, that was not like a, oh my God, clip it. Like, oh my God, Dr. K made a joke about coming because people were asking if Chase coming and I was like, he's trying to come like, oh my God. Like, okay, so here's the thing. There are two words that are homonyms, but mean very different things. Right? Like, is your mom coming on an airplane? It's like, yeah, my mom is coming on an airplane. Like, there's there's just so many different, you know. Dr. K, my tonsil hurts because of my TMJ and my teeth clenching. What do I do? Um... I would see a doctor for your TMJ. Oh, 
homophones? Homonym? Homophone. You're right. Homophone. My bad. I don't know what a homonym is. Homophone is two words that sound the same, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the weird thing is I've never heard of TMJ causing tonsil problems. That sounds weird. So the other reason to see a doctor is because if you've got problems with your tonsils, like sometimes you'll get like weird autoimmune stuff and things like that, allergies and infections. So usually t TMJ can actually ref cause problems with things like tinnitus. Um, okay, everything is the right setting. You want to try restarting comp? Oh my god, Zoom interview. Let's do... Um... Okay, he's going to try to restart, and then we've got backup plans, okay? Stay with us, chat. Thank you so much for being patient, everybody. Sometimes in life, the best things are worth waiting for. And this conversation, I guess, has to be epic. So here's the thing. we got to talk about balance in life for a second. So... You know, I hate to say this, but everyone sort of thinks that, like, life is balanced, right? We're kind of like, oh, my God, like, this person has an advantage, and so therefore, like, I have the same amount of advantages, and I just need to uncover my advantages. And, like, everyone sort of thinks, like, we sort of assume, we live in this world where we assume that things are, like, equal. The truth of the matter is we're not all born with, like, the same level of stat points. It's like, it's kind of like the old school D&D &D, where it's like you roll 3d6 six times. And some people get really good stats and some people get really bad stats. And that's like really the real tragedy of life. Honestly, this might have been my experience as a psychiatrist is that things are not fair or equal. And I think the more we understand that, like hopefully off the better we'll be. Because I think the biggest problem is that sometimes like people just need more help than others. And sometimes people are capable of helping more. But the problem is that we compare, right? We're like, okay, like this person is doing this, so I should do this. Or I feel less than this person. Because there's some sense of equality. Does that kind of make sense? Like if you make a comparison with someone else and you conclude oh, I should be doing this because this person is doing this, or I feel less than this person because this person is doing all these things and I'm not doing that much. No, it's like y'all are like, it's a completely different game. The reason that person is doing so much is because of chances are their circumstances and spawn point. And y'all may say, but like, what do you mean? Like, that's not how it is, right? Isn't it like, that's not how the world works. But actually, if you look at data, it's kind of how it is. So if you look at what, you know, what correlates the most with median income, is socioeconomic standing, so how rich your parents are, things like parental involvement, and whether parents, like, prioritized your education growing up. It's not actually IQ. Like, IQ doesn't correlate very tightly with median income. And so, if you, it, it's really circumstances. It's all about your spawn point. So, cut yourself a little bit of slack, chat. And if someone is doing better than you at life, it's okay for them to be doing better than you because y'all are playing different games. I discovered something recently, if y'all are kind of curious. Who here struggles with envy? Y'all struggle with envy? This is kind of related. Special stats from Fallout? Absolutely, dude. Okay, so there's this really interesting text called the Vishuddha Maga, which is the path of purification. And it talks a lot about the different problems in our mind. And a lot of people end up struggling with envy. 
right? So for, let's like let's understand envy for a second. Envy is something that you see something in someone. Let's see. Oh, oh was Che here? No. Okay, no problem. Let's do this. I wonder though. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, I was talking about envy. I'm trying to do tech support and teach all about envy at the same time. It's like, what is going on here? Okay, let's talk about envy. So if you struggle with envy, it's interesting because we don't really teach people. Okay, here we go. Damn it. Or yay, I suppose. Okay, does this work? Okay, I can hear you now. Okay. Right on. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on with disk. I've never had those problems before. Oh, it's all good, man. Um, let me do this. Let me just disconnect from the Discord call. And yeah, then let I'm gonna me do this same. turn this on. There we go. Should be good. Just going to get my camera settings figured out here. And now I just realized I have a slight problem. Because what's that? I'm going to have to... Um, I'm going to have to change. There oh, there you are. Boom. Nice. Okay. okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. I Disc is always the best for me. And yeah, I like we're on disc constantly. Uh, I don't know what's going on with it today. Yeah, let me just um, grab a... I have to grab the right... Chrome window. Oh, I feel, yeah. So you can uh, screen grab everything. Yeah. So let me just do that real quick. Let's hope it works. Nope. It didn't work. Mm. Here we go. All right. Hey. Hey. I, I, we're I good? Think, I think we're good. It's What's up, not dude? a stream without a few technical difficulties. Yes, absolutely, man. All right, so we'll 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 get to envy at the end, chat. Yeah, I promise we'll do a quick segment on envy. I was talking about envy. Maybe we'll envy. get to it. Yeah. So, uh, welcome, Che. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for being here. Do uh, you want to just tell us a little bit about? We watched a couple of your clips. It's like, mm. it's good stuff, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate um, it. And so tell us just a little bit about, uh, you know, where we can find you, what you do. Um, so I'm on all social platforms at Che Dorena. Uh, I'm a stand-up comic. I've been doing stand-up for about like 10 years. Um, and that was kind of the catalyst for me to start making content and do all those kinds of things uh, in terms of creation. It was like a, I was doing stand-up but pretty much every single night for seven or eight years and then pandemic hit couldn't do it anymore so then looked for other mediums to keep creating uh and found that there was like huge reach on social media got like way more reach than you can get in a comedy club so then just started like hounding that really well to kind of get out to more people and sell more tickets and do all those things to make sure you can have a successful entertainment career that sounds hard uh it uh, yeah it is hard like it's not easy but it's um i think it's a big part of if you that whole thing if you love what you do you'll never work a day in your life um being able to feel motivated because you really enjoy the process of of what you're doing makes it a whole lot easier and can you tell me like what's it you said you were doing stand-up every night for seven years yeah, not like every single night, yeah. but uh, there, my sort of my rule for myself was a night off every two weeks. Um, and that's pretty, I was pretty consistent with that. For me to take a night off more than it, uh, honestly, it was, I had to set that rule because I wasn't taking enough time off. Um, so I, yeah, pretty much every single night you would go out, whether or not it was some little open mic or you're booked on a few chosen a night you try to get somewhere between 10 and 20 spots a week um so you can be going up and really like grinding and working on your craft uh that's something that's 
I, I'm not too well versed with a lot of other uh, performance arts, but I know with stand up, it's something very specific to stand up where you really want to be uh, on stage as much as possible. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what's it? Um, and and by the way, is there, is there something in particular you want to talk about today? Um, I don't know if there's something in particular that I want to cover. Like, I know we dive into mental health, and I was just kind of ready to be upfront and forward with anything you threw at me. Okay. And I, I saw that for some reason it says that we're talking about death. Death. Like, oh yeah. No, they, I remember that was the, they, uh, that was the thing they were like prompted that was put forward, uh, in terms of you, as there was a, uh, it was my rep or maybe it was directly from you asked what, how do you deal with mental health and death is usually how I kind of ground myself. That's um, bizarre. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, um, it sounds very morbid, but I think it's really peaceful. Like, I think uh, accepting that you're going to die. Like, I think if you, like, how often do you really sit and think about that? Like, you're you're going to die. Like, that's inevitable. Like, I think we, because I know I definitely, whoop, prior to coming to acceptance the, to the fact that I'm going to die, I would live in, I wouldn't say it was like a fantasy, but in a little bit of an unrealistic place where I was like, oh, maybe we'll get, reach the fountain of youth. There's all these technological advancements. Maybe something will happen where I will not die. I will live forever or, or whatever it is. Mm. And I think there's people who convince themselves through mystical things or religious things that your soul will live on or all this other stuff, which potentially it does. I don't have the answer to what happens after you die, but all I can confirm is that you will die. You, no one has not died. Everyone has died very successfully. Um, and being grounded in that, in knowing that this experience is finite, uh, I don't know, it gives me a, a sense of peace and calm. Um, How does that knowing, work? Well, I think a lot of anxiety comes from not knowing what will happen. So you're like, okay, what if, like, say if I was anxious about doing this podcast today, well, what if it goes bad? What if someone clips something out of context mm -hmm. or blah, blah, blah. And then you start rambling off this unknown, like Uber found that when they, one thing they added that really helped the customer process was showing you how far away your car was because that unknown gave the customer anxiety uh, and made them, yeah, made them uncomfortable. Uh, knowing that no matter what happens, you will die uh gives me a, a sense of calm knowing that like oh no matter how bad things go or how good things go the end result is all the same so have some peace in knowing that uh you know the final outcome and so just live your life in whichever way you, you choose obviously try to be nice to people and, and uh, give a positive light around you but it, it don't stress yeah i mean because I, I i i've talked to some people who i, I you know, for the record, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of um, everything from like psychoanalysis and psychotherapy talks about dealing with the fear of death. Um, and even in like the Eastern uh, kind of philosophies, they talk a lot about how there's just a, a very fundamental fear of death and that getting to peace over that fear of death is really how you start to live life fully. There's a book called the Tibetan book of living and dying. And then we see that a lot in the practice of medicine where like, you know, you've got a patient with cancer and they like come to terms with it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to die. Like their cancer could be, you know, put into remission or even curable. But I I've seen firsthand a lot of the value of like accepting that you're going to die. And it can be for a lot of people very liberating or grounding. Um, it can also be very terrifying for a lot of people. And a lot of people will panic because if I'm going to die, that means that like, I don't have enough time to do everything that I want to do. Yeah, I, that's true. But then I think it, it is definitely a motivator. Like, I, I think you accept death. You understand that there's no such thing as perfection. So you kind of, when you start to cross those two things together, which I'm, I think a lot of us, especially like you're in the creation field, people who are trying to make stuff, I think you can definitely um, get... Uh, what's the word like get caught up in this perfectionist mindset where perfection doesn't exist. So knowing that you're going to die. 
So you should take the leap towards the things you're going to do because you're going to run out of time. Uh, and knowing that things can't be perfect and it's impossible for something to be perfect. Um, a perfect example is I'm going to Greece in uh, September for a friend's wedding. And my sister has wanted to go to Greece since she was about 20 and she's uh, turning 40 this year. So it's been like a 20 year thing of she's like, I want to go to Greece. She was supposed to go when she was young and then she was supposed to go on her honeymoon. But then she had kids. She got like pregnant right away. And now she's got three kids and a husband and a life and all this stuff. And all these things are going on constantly. And she was like, I've always wanted to go to Greece. And I was like, just come with me. Just come. And she was like, oh, I don't know if I can. And I was like, I'll buy your plane ticket. Let's just go. Let's just go to Greece. Let's go to Greece together. Because it's like it's you waiting for this perfection for this moment for all the things to come together it's now 20 years you've been putting a dream on hold it's like just just do things all the time that you want to do within reason don't put like you got kids don't put your kids at risk don't put your health at risk like uh, i mean depending on what you consider putting at risk you want to go skydiving go skydiving um but just go do for one doing you learn more in the process of doing than you do in all this like sort of pre prep idea of doing. So like you say, if I wanted, I, I'm a comedian. If I spent a year learning about how to write jokes and learning about what I got to do, if I get on stage and talking to comedians and interviewing people, I would have learned so much less than if I had just wrote whatever I could write and then go to shows and did the is doing comedy in that year. So just go and do, and you learn more in that process. Um, and knowing that you're going to die can hopefully motivate you to go do. Um, but yeah, so I, a death is a big motivator and calmer, and like it, it just grounds you. And like sometimes you got to like touch yourself and realize like this is tactile, this is real, the stuff around me is real. Oh shit, I'm in the room. Um, and you like I don't know. But, it just yeah, it's calming. But Jake. If I just go out there and do stuff, first of all, it's scary. And second of mm -hmm. all, there are consequences. Of like, course. What if I what if I do it wrong? Well, you're gonna do it wrong. Like I think that's the 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 acceptance in knowing the like living your life in a in sort of this paralyzing stage of what if. First you can every negative argument of what if you can just counter with a positive argument of what if. You can be like, Oh, what if I get hurt? What if you don't? Like that it, we're, we're floating in the same area of logic where it's actually probably more likely that the positive happens depending on what the situation is. But if we're talking about like, I don't know, you're going to go out and um, sign up for beer league soccer or something. And you're like, oh, I've wanted to do this, but I didn't. Like I recently signed up for Muay Thai classes and because I realized I had been putting I, it off for 10 years. Worse. Sorry, we have a. Oh, no worries. I'm, I'm working. Can we talk about this in a minute? like in an hour, an hour and maybe 70 minutes, okay? You can give me your sign. Come here. Okay. Then shoo. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Thank you. I love school that. Is, school is out. I love it. I love it. Thanks, sweetie. Bye. Okay, thank you. She made a anyway. Um, yeah, so you were saying uh, that 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 it operates on the same level of logic that there's like a positive what if for a negative what if what if. Yeah, and obviously it depends on what the situation is, but like like I said, I I recently signed up for Muay Thai classes because I did the same thing of waiting for this perfect moment. I've been putting off going to Muay Thai for ten years. I've wanted to do it for that long. Um, I boxed when I was younger. I've always had a fascination and admiration for fight sports. I never, I don't even think I'll ever spar. Um, I, but I like learning. I like ex learning while I exercise. I think martial arts are an incredible skill to have. It's like a skill you can use naked, which is like not a lot of skills are like that. Um, but uh, I'd been putting off for 10 years and there's all those things that were going on in my head. It's like, oh, what if I don't have enough time? What if I can't get it in? What if blue, blah, blue, blue? There was all these what ifs. And I was like, just go, just go to the class, just go sign up and just do the class and then just take it from there. And then it fit into my schedule. I figured out where it fit now that I was doing it, how, how to get better in the class, when I can show up, when it, everything worked, everything worked 
with this thing I was putting off for 10 years for a perfect moment, I got to fit into my life in probably about a month. And that's a month of going like once a week. And now I go like two or three times a week. Um, and I, when I can't go, I don't go. But I'm, I'm doing the thing that I've wanted to do for a long time. Yeah, so, so Che, I mean, uh, just to kind of, I, I get what you're saying, but like, how are you able to do that? How? How? I I think just you just go and do it and you accept that failure is you will fail at not at everything, but you will like even this class or sometimes I fail to show up or I fail to schedule in properly or I fail to give my best or even focus properly in class. You 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 will fail and accepting that that is just like death inevitable. That perfection doesn't exist. That failure is absolutely absolutely going to happen. As long as I mean, I guess you could avoid failure by doing nothing if you lived in like a padded room, but you would probably still fail at something within the confines of that room. Um, you'd fail at life, dude. Yeah, you fail at life. There you go. <laughs> uh, so accepting that the, those things are part of your reality gives you this freedom, and it's also like, what are you trying to attain? Are you trying to be like? the richest person in the world are you trying to be like the best muay thai fighter in the world the best comedian in the world like are you are you trying to chase something or are you just trying to experience pieces of life um like there's certain parts of my life where i'm trying to excel and there's certain parts of my life where i just like to partake and taste uh and enjoy like if i go to a restaurant i'm not trying to aerate the wine and the food to, to get this certain experience from it i'm just well, I just like food and I like eating and I'm sitting and eating and hanging out with friends and we're talking and shooting the shit and, and the whole moment is, is good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's fa- so just, uh, it's interesting to hear you kind of talk about this stuff because I've had a couple of cases where I've worked with people who, um, we've seen some interesting consequences of challenging their fear of death. So the one really bizarre thing is that a lot of people struggle with procrastination. Yes. And one thing that I found is that like in 20 to 25% of people that I work with who have a fear of death, most of them are actually pretty successful to begin with. But if you can conquer your fear of death, procrastination actually disappears. And what happens in these people is like if you're kind of procrastinating, right, you're waiting for the right time. Mm -hmm. And in their mind, they sort of have this infinite amount of time. The passage of time is really painful. They can feel every day that they lose. They can feel every year that they lose. They can feel every five years that they lose. Mm -hmm. But they don't really think about how much time they have left. Yes. And once you realize that, like, this game ends in a certain Mm -hmm. amount of time, it can be incredibly transformative because then, like, what are you going to do today? If you want to attain this thing, like you can wait for the perfect moment and then it may or may not happen. You can spend 10 years waiting for it. You can spend 10 years planning for it, getting ready for it, prepping for it, researching for it, but you're never going to do it. And once you sort of realize that, okay, like the time in the hourglass is running out and whether I do it or don't do it, the time gets spent either way. And oftentimes what happens with people who procrastinate is they're looking for a good deal. Right. That's what perfection is like. I want to set everything up. So when I do it, I'm successful so that my investment yields a good return. Yes. Once you understand that you're going to die, that cost is being spent like over and over and over again. Like you're losing that time no matter what you decide to do. So the question is, what do you want to do today? Do you want to that time is gone? Disappearing. And, and so sometimes what people will do is they'll like sort of realize, oh, crap, like I have to like start living today, even if it is not the way that I want. Or and I, I really love this, what you said earlier about are you trying to attain or are you trying to experience? Yeah. And I think I think both are, are valid forms of, of experience life, experiencing life. But there are uh, I don't know. There are certain moments where I think you got to like step back and just experience. Like, uh, I think we do the, like what you were saying about, Oh, I'm waiting for this perfect moment. There's this, I think we're taught this idea of like retirement and, and uh, we're going to build for a better tomorrow and all these things instead of just cashing in a little bit right now, because tomorrow is never a uh, guarantee. Like my, like I watched my dad, my dad was a very good example of this was my dad 
worked super hard, worked two jobs for a long time. My parents kind of grinded themselves to dust. They were, were like kind of lower income family and then moved into like a middle income family. Um, but they, they sacrificed a lot to make sure that we had some stuff and their marriage was always rocky. And the, it, it was a lot of things of trying to fit into the slots of like standard uh, uh like suburban lifestyle uh and then when my parents when i got older i got in i was thinking I was like 20 my parents got divorced and then it felt like uh my dad kind of moved on and started living his life the way he wanted to he was traveling a lot more he was kind of doing whatever he wanted he was retired he met a new lady all these things and he did that for about four years and then he got alzheimer's and he got alzheimer's from uh sleepless nights of working constant like graveyard shifts and stuff it was it it's we don't have a direct correlation with that, but the type of Alzheimer's he has is non-genetic and is exacerbated from lack of sleep. Um, so he sat, he sacrificed all these things to live in this idea of what he thought he was supposed to live in for a better tomorrow. And then when he got the opportunity to have it, he had a few years in there and then lost the ability to live that better tomorrow. So it's like I capture these things now a little bit more uh, and experience th these parts of life now a little bit more and don't get caught up too much in this like work now, save for later lifestyle because you might not get the later. And also you want to, even if you are older and you live into your late years, like you want to, when you're in your younger years, you want to be out with your friends and doing stuff and, and trying to drink in as much as you can because those experiences are good and they don't necessarily have to cost you a lot. There are me and my, um, me and my buddies go up to a friend's cottage and there's like, you know, last time I we went up, there was like 10 of us. We're all comedians. We would like do mushrooms and go on hikes and just like laugh harder than I've ever laughed before. And one of my buddies, the guy whose cottage it is, and this isn't like a fancy cottage. This is a place where we'd have to uh, jump on a bicycle and then ride down next to the lake. Cause there was a toilet down there. We used the toilet there cause the toilet was busted in the cottage. Um, but one of my buddies was like, this is what, I live for these moments. And he's 100% right. The, like the amount of fun and joy we had in like that four to eight period, it, 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 um, is, it is bigger than a lot of any of the other uh, experiences I've had. So, it, and if you get super rich and super successful, and then you're doing that on a yacht rather than a cottage where the toilet doesn't work, it doesn't matter. The people and the experience are the same and you're going to get the same enjoyment out of it. So try and focus on those experiences and having those moments because one day you will not be able to. So, uh, Che, that's uh, fascinating. Can I ask? So it sounds like you're, you said your parents got, got divorced when you were 20? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm they. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go for it. No, I was just going to say, they, yeah, they were, they were, uh, yeah, together for like 30 years or so, but it was not, uh, I, I think at the start it was good. And then uh, financial things were always a burden. Uh, and I think the it just uh, slowly crumbled apart and they definitely did the stay together for the kids. Okay. And, and when, when would you say that you, you like sort of found that grounding with fear of death? Oh, I think. It probably would have been, it was definitely before I moved to New York. I haven't been here for very long, but I would say like five, six years ago, I think uh, I really came to terms with like, oh, what I was doing, I didn't, it, it didn't like saving for the future, saving for, not that I don't save, I'm, I'm very smart with my money. I'm not telling people who are watching this, hey, just spend all your money willy nilly, but focusing on the enjoyment side of life rather than pushing myself into an area where I don't enjoy myself to save for something that may not even exist. Uh, yeah, I think it was through doing stand up and stuff and kind of self discovery through that probably five or six years ago was probably when I came to terms with it. And how many years ago was your dad diagnosed with Alzheimer's? I want to say four, could have been five years ago. There's definitely a correlation between those two. Because, like, watching him not get the opportunity to live his life was like, oh, well, I'm not going to make the same mistake for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was just, like, surprised by how, you know, that, that seems like, that seems significant to me. Oh, oh, absolutely. And it's like. It was it was kind of a weird experience because I because there was very much a division in my house. My parents weren't very close and they were fighting. And then so I distanced myself from them. So I felt like I never really was close to either of them. And then 
kind of started building a, a relationship with my dad, but then he got Alzheimer's. So then it was like, we didn't, couldn't really communicate or anything anymore. Um, so it, it was a weird sense, but I, I definitely saw the process of how this stuff happened. And I was like, I don't want to make that same mistake. I really want to take the time to enjoy and live my life. This trip to Greece is another example, not just for my sister, but for myself. I almost didn't go. I almost was like, oh, you know, I'm going to have to take so much time off work, blah, 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 all the things you tell yourself. I was like, just go to Greece. And then I booked an extra week to go to Berlin on my own. And then it, like, I've never been to Europe. Let's go see a few different things. Um, because, yeah, because I'm like, oh, when will I get this opportunity again? And how long am I going to put this opportunity off for? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because I, I, you know, some people I've, I've worked with, Che, when they have an experience like yours, they, like you seem to have pivoted hard towards like living life and loving it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when I work with people, what I see is they, they kind of get crushed by it. Like it's sort of like, okay, I'm just getting to know my dad. You know, I'm starting to build a relationship and like he's kind of taken away from me. And then they're, they sort of like enter into this like paranoid zone. Of like, you know, yeah. like it feels like pillars in my life can be like just taken away from me. And if if anything can get can disappear at any time. How do I find any kind of stability? How do I because I, I don't want to make the same mistake. Right. So it's kind of weird. Like you're saying I don't want to make the same mistake. So I'm going to YOLO it. And some people are like, I don't want to make the same mistake. So I can't ever YOLO it. Like I've yeah. got to be sure because I can't I afford to make the mistake. I think um, I think I've always been a very rational person. I've always been very like grounded in reality. Um, two plus two equals four. Like uh, always in all of my. I remember one of the earliest, not one of my earliest memories, but uh, my earliest example of this. I think it was maybe five or six. I used to suck my index finger. I suck my index finger and play with my ear. This was like a comfort thing I did. Um, and it, I was doing it so much, it was like pushing my teeth forward. And my parents were like, oh, they would put hot sauce on my finger, these different things to try and get me to stop. And nothing would get me to stop. The thing that got me to stop was they told me, they're like, you're going to get braces. And I was like, okay, I don't care. They're like, you know, people might make fun of you if you get braces. I was like, I don't care. They're like, it's going to hurt. I said, I don't care. They said, it's going to cost $3,000. And I was like, oh, that's a lot of money. And then I stopped. That was the, the rational grounding of, like it's gonna cost money that's like i understood that my my parents always money was a big thing growing up so i knew that was gonna be a big deal that's what made me stop i've always been very very rational so i i guess i don't know if this is healthy or unhealthy but i saw what i was losing i saw that i didn't have as close of a relationship with either of my parents and as upsetting as that is and i i thought i was gonna have this opportunity like i remember my dad came to visit me when I was in Toronto. And this is before, this is a few years before he got diagnosed. We had like a week together where we were like going out, eating, hanging out. And when my family was all together, there was definitely, it was, everything was very disingenuous. Mm. Um, uh, and my mom isn't the most like trustworthy person. She's a little bit of a liar and a little bit of a manipulator. And so there's this like weird, um, like I guess there was like a weird hierarchy in the family no one was no one felt like they were being honest with each other and everyone felt like they were walking on eggshells uh, with uh, all interactions so then now that this was all removed I felt like my dad we had like an honest week with each other where we honestly talked to each other's two people getting really getting to know each other um and then he caught Alzheimer's not long after that but that was like we had that week together uh, and then he definitely started to go before then and the communication was not the same. Uh, and then he got uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So I, it would have been nice to have that time. I felt like I was going into this next stage of my life where I was going to get to know my dad as an authentic person. He was going to get to know me as an authentic person, but I didn't have that. And I also didn't lose it because it, it was never there. Um, so I just had to come to terms with it. Just had to come to terms with that was that's reality what's it like having a mom who's a little bit of a liar uh I, it's another one of those things man you uh i there was a long time where i was very angry about it um uh, the thing she said the 
the like the relationship we had i didn't i haven't talked to her in years and years and years it's a relationship i cut out because i felt like it just didn't benefit me in any way bringing if i was to bring her back into my life it would i think it would be a detriment to my life um so it was another thing i just had to accept that that relationship doesn't exist but i have close friends i have close brothers and sisters and i have these people where i can have these growth conversations i can uh, I can ask them questions. I, if I need help in in certain areas, I have a good support circle around me. Is it okay if I we we I ask you a couple questions about that? Of course. So, because uh, here's what I'm thinking. I think that unfortunately, not all mothers are great. Mm -hmm. Not all mothers are even good. Um, and the challenge is that oftentimes it's hard to tell or hard to accept when you're in that situation. And I imagine there may be people who are listening to this conversation right now who are in situations with like a toxic parent mm -hmm. and they may not even realize it. Yeah. Um, uh, Cause oftentimes what toxic parents will do is they trick children into thinking that the child is the problem. Like that's how they yes. function. Yes. Um, and as long as you have a child to blame, then as a parent, you don't have to take responsibility. Yes, And then the child is put in this situation where they're bearing all the blame. And so they never even think, oh, I need to actually like remove this person from my life or set kind of boundaries because I'm actually the one that's the problem. I need yes. to fix things. But yes. that they go on trying to fix the wrong part of the equation. But that yes. part isn't busted. So they end up inevitably failing over and over and over again. They fail over and over and over again. The problem still continues. So they try harder and it just creates this vicious cycle. Yeah. So what did it, I mean, how did you discover that your mom was a liar? Um, I think for me, I, when I was 18, I moved out mm -hmm. and I moved to the coast. I lived, I grew up in British Columbia, like maybe an uh, hour outside of Vancouver. Um, and so I moved to the coast and I lived there. I was going to college out there. And so I got to have like time away and grow and be my own person. I think that's very important for people to look like kind of leave their hometown because I think you can be very disingenuous in high school because that's what high school is about. High school is kind of about conforming um, to fit in. So I got to go and be my own person. And then I moved to Mexico for a little while uh, and I was uh, living out there for three years and got to grow and be my own person. So I, I had like a physical separation and got to do a lot of self-exploration and um, through that came to terms with that a lot of the things they said weren't true. I could see as you grow as a person, you can see the inconsistencies in the stories they told, how they would talk from person to person, see how they would lie to other people um, and see how they would treat you in front of people and but treat you in private. Um, and the, then you can come to terms with being in control of the situation and knowing that this person is like that and that you don't have to uh you don't have to carry their baggage like this person like you're saying they would blame you for things that's like oh that's not mine i don't need to hold on to that uh i can let that go and they're going to choose to be whoever they're going to be and i don't need to change them I, I think a big part of it was me trying to fix these things and realizing that i'm the youngest in the family like i uh i for a while i felt like i should have mended something between my parents or there was like two sides of the family try to mend something there uh and realizing that i'm the youngest and being like oh no, no all these people should be more mature and able to deal with this more than i am i'm not carrying any of this you guys go deal with it if you want to be friends be friends if you don't you don't i do not care and i'm going to hold on to the relationships that i feel benefit me better or at least benefit both sides and, and this one clearly does not and having the separation from that person lets you sort of uh, unravel all the things that happened. Um, what kind of two-facedness did you see from your mom? Like, can you give us an example? Um, yeah, a great example um, would be like there was a family member who was sick uh, on my, uh, like, is someone who is on my sister's side. Uh, so I have like a split down the family. We have a brother and sister on one side and a sister on the other side. So my sister on one side, a family member was sick and my brother and sister on the other side from my dad's side, we're gonna go visit. My mom told them, no, don't visit. She doesn't want visitors. But they, and that family member was sick, had a separate relationship with my brother and sister and found out later that this person never said that. 
that they that my mom had made this up to keep a division through in the family which is that's a very it's yeah you're just lying and and moving chess pieces around for whatever reason uh and uh yeah that it was stuff like that where you just you just learn that you can't trust a person and so there's no point in like kind of keeping them around wow um so let me let me kind of recap sort of what i heard and and i think this is actually great so the first thing is how do you know if you're in a relationship with someone like parent or otherwise where it is kind of like toxic and you're like being taken advantage of so i think a big part of it is if you feel like a chess piece because yeah. i think even people who don't want to admit that their parent is a problem like they feel like a chess piece you kind of feel like this sort of situation where like okay i'm a pawn and i'm being like thrust into battle mm -hmm. and i'm supposed to like someone is sending me into battle to like take out the enemy queen or yes. rook but i'm just yeah. outgunned and i like i'm i'm doomed to fail i'm set up to fail Yes. And then what they do is they're like, fucking pawn. Like I sent you in there to do a job and you can't yeah, and even do like... that job. And then you feel responsible, right? Because you're the one who's actually on the front lines. Yes. And then what happens is like, you're, you're kind of left in this situation where they're placing the responsibility on you, but they're not giving you the freedom or the control to actually try to solve the problem. Because I'm also yes. kind of noticing that your, your mom kind of set you up in a lot of ways where she didn't say like, you know, she didn't let you fly free. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that you actually started. When I asked you, how did you know that she was a liar? You actually started with physical distance. Yes. Which I think is something that is underrated. So a lot of times, especially nowadays with the Internet, if someone is in a toxic relationship, they think that the answer is something that they can do or they can learn. I mean, hell, I mean, our channel is successful because people try to come to us for answers for their problems. Yes. I think the real tragedy is that sometimes, like, it actually starts with physical distance. And if you look at um, research on trauma, the, the person who originally developed, I don't know if you're familiar with, like, complex PTSD, like this term or concept. No, um, no. So, the, the, you know, PTSD is like a, is post-traumatic stress disorder and it's usually induced by one event mm -hmm. so like you know I, I was either assaulted or i was like you know had a bad i was in war or something and there was like a really bad mission or something like that but there's another flavor of ptsd which is called complex ptsd which is when the trauma is chronic so these are like people who um are in like concentration camps people who are prisoners of war people who are in abusive relationships like with parents growing up and the really interesting thing is that in order to heal from that the first thing you need is like safety and space mm -hmm. so a lot of times i see people that are struggling to like fix their problems like in their four walls but what i think is really interesting is that physically getting space seemed to be like the first step for you oh yeah absolutely i feel like that physical space it gives you the freedom to uh, think and move without this person. You're not turning to this person for advice anymore uh, because obviously they're going to give you their skewed view. Uh, and you build relationships outside of people who know them. Uh, and that's a like a great way to know if someone is toxic. It's like when you have the relationships outside of that person, you can compare the relationships. You can be like, okay, this I have this friend over here and when I hang out with them, I have fun and they don't uh, ask me for things or need me to do stuff for them. And they don't try to like put me in compromising situations. And then I have a friend over here. And when I do, when I leave these interactions, I often feel bad or less than, and I, they make me feel guilty for things and they, all, they implement these negative emotions on me. So when you can start to compare and contrast two things side by side, you can start to see that one is clearly better than the other and the and the one that's bad is using a lot of weird tendencies that the other people around you aren't using and that helps you understand uh have a uh, understanding of what is right and wrong in a relationship with someone yeah and i, I think it's it's interesting because you, you kind of said that so what you're describing almost sounds like a cult of one yeah where you're like you're like in a cult but there's just like one member and it's you and then there's the leader 
Yeah. And they're imposing a lot of this, like, you know, almost like brainwashing or like manipulation, like controlling your relationships, like inducing emotions in you, like guilt. And and I, th I think it's really interesting how the way that you saw that was noticing the inconsistencies from the outside. Does this person like say things in weird ways? Do they try to gatekeep information? Do they try to keep you from like talking directly to other people? Um, it, it feels very cultish, actually. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I think is really, really important is that a lot of times, even if people can recognize that this is toxic, and even if they can get away, one, one of the things I've noticed is that they carry the responsibility with them. Yeah. And so I, I've had tons of patients who will, every time they go home for the holidays, it's like, it's a mess. But yes. they feel obligated. And they feel yeah. guilty and they're like, okay, I got to take my like bitter medicine. You know, yeah. I, I can build my life, but for two weeks out of the year, I got to go back and, and go back into this. And one thing that I think is really cool is that I think you're a quitter. And I think yeah. part of the no. problem, yeah, right. And part of the problem is in, in today's society, we actually think about being a quitter is a bad thing. But I think some of the, the most interesting things, quitting a relationship is one of the healthiest and best things you can do. Yes. And I would say that quitting the wrong relationship has a greater impact in your life than finding the right one. Yes. And just being able to say like, hey, you know what? I'm not responsible for this. I quit. I'm done. Yes. You yes. can sort of figure out your own shit. Yes. I think that's uh, like taking things and putting them back on your terms. Like when I come to visit now, I don't necessarily come. I came home for Christmas this past year for the first time in like 10 years. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do this again. Not because the actual Christmas experience was bad, but just because the traveling around Christmas time sucks. But I, I took traveling and going home and made it my own for a while. It's like I'm coming in the summertime when it's nice out and we can do outdoor activities when I want to be there. And if I'm not there for Christmas or something, that's it. it, it I'm doing that for you constantly and i've done things for you guys for so much so now i'm going to do things for myself and we can make things equal um but i'm not going to compromise so far that I, I i'm not having a good time while everyone else is i'm curious has that affected your um is it okay if i ask you like a couple questions about romantic relationships oh for sure um has that affected your romantic relationships at all so to be completely transparent on romantic relationships, I've only dated maybe like two girls seriously. Uh, and each time the relationships haven't lasted very long. I'm usually once I get about six months in, I'm like, uh, I don't know if I want to date anymore. I am in definitely a mental space where I don't know um, what I want. I'm definitely super work focused. So I've up until just about recently, like this year, I was like, maybe I put effort into cultivating like a proper relationship again, because everything has been work focused. And that's been like, I've seen relationships as sort of detrimental to me working harder, where now I don't as much. But I also uh, am trying to come to terms whether or not I'm like, am I, would I be happier in like a, an open relationship? Or do I want a monogamous relationship? Or like, what are the standards that uh, like what I know what the standards are of what people think we should do. Like you're supposed to meet someone, fall in love, get married and like the white picket fence or whatever. But I'm like, is that because that's what we're genetically made to do? Or is that uh, like subconscious programming in quotations? Like there's all these social norms that are kind of falling apart before us and being rebuilt in different ways. And I don't know where I fit in there. And so now I'm, interested in exploring those things again to see what i want but yeah romantically i haven't ever really pursued anyone I, and i think definitely my parents having a, a rocky relationship for so long I, when i was younger i just assumed that relationships failed like if i was in, in my 20s uh, definitely like all my relationships were like my uh, early to mid 20s every person I dated, the, my mentality was like, well, this is going to end eventually. Like this is there were in our uh, 20s, like we're not going to meet someone we're going to be with for the rest of our life. Like that's just that seemed completely irrational to me because I saw older people taking a shot at it and then failing miserably. So what chance do we have? This is more just for fun. Okay, interesting.
So it sounds like it's something you're thinking through, trying to figure out what's what's right for you. I also notice you're being quite analytical about it in terms of, okay, like the world has changed. So even if there was a formula that arguably worked, which I, I think, you know, we know that monogamy has been, has not been... Um, it works for some, works for, it doesn't yeah. work for others. Like it's... And, yeah, I think it, it, and that I'm trying to figure out where I fit in that. Like, do I want to be monogamous? Do I not want to be monogamous? Like, and then there's all the other things of like your jealousy, your emotions, your that get that come into play, and and really feeling that out and not rushing into anything because I feel like I have a lot of time with this and spending the time to figure out what I want. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, really focusing on how I feel through each situation is like a great recipe and communicating that to whoever i'm with is a great recipe for being successful um so you mentioned i may need it sure go for it um so uh a couple other things so you mentioned that you, you're focused on craft right now can you just tell us a little bit about like what it's like to be a comedian and and how you view your craft, what it takes to succeed. Yeah, um, for comics, it's like comics are a, a different breed for sure. Uh, it's something I you that you don't really get it until you're in. I think any like if you get really serious into CrossFit, uh, then the people you hang out with, the way you look at the world. Like if you go out to eat, you look at the menu differently than someone who's not very focused on their calorie intake every day. Like it, it, it becomes who you are as a person. And that potentially was who you are. were all along. Tom comedy is very similar. Where it's like, you're, you're constantly joking about stuff, riffing about stuff. Everything for the most part, everything is on the table. When you sit down with comics, very rarely, do we go like, oh, uh, how's the weather? Or, or it's, oh, it was hot today. You try, you go like right to this. I wish serious isn't the right word. It's just like we want to talk about real tangible things and have more intimate conversations with people because we divulge our personal shit on stage in front of strangers. So peer to peer, it's like, yeah, that we know we can talk like that. And it sometimes when you're in conversations with people who, uh can't do that it can be a little under stimulating one thing about going like family get-togethers is there's there's always this thing and this is just i think this is just good etiquette but you sometimes when you're hanging out with a bunch of people and family like the conversations stay very gray like oh the we're putting the kids in this no one gets too political no one gets too uh too deep into any topics because no one wants to get anyone uncomfortable or comedy it's the exact opposite we can argue and talk about different things and everyone's on the same page because whether or not we agree because that is what we do um so that's my one of the best parts about the craft is like the hang but then in terms of of creating and doing it it's like you try and write every day at least this is my process you try and write every day you try and get on stage I try to do 10 to uh, 20 times a week. You want to be getting up and trying out your stuff, working on stuff, taking it to new rooms, uh, evolving as the platform evolves. So like uh, everyone's doing like crowd work clips now. So I make sure I do a bunch of crowd work when I'm going on the road. So I have stuff to clip out and keep the social media and all those platforms going. Social is a big side of it. Podcasting is a big side of it now. Um, so understanding how to learn and use these new skills as the landscape develops and changes um, while constantly trying to get funnier and funnier and funnier. And I think depending on what kind of comedian you are, you value things at different stages. Like some people have ultra successful podcasts and live, they're not as good. I'm not naming any names or talking about any spe specific. It's just something that happens. Like if the podcast is by far your, sorry, just the sounds of New York City right now. I pass. can barely hear anything. Oh, you can't? Okay, yeah. great, great. Um, but uh, yeah, like if you if you value the podcast, your main, main income, 
bringer, then maybe your live stuff isn't as good. Um, but their podcasting could be incredible. Uh, but I think for myself, the core has always been stand up first. I want the live performance. I want people to watch my online content, go, Oh, this is great. I love this. Then come to the live show and be like, yo, this is incredible. This is the, this is the best. Cause that's the thing I've been doing for the longest and crafting the most. I really want at the end of this whole stand up journey to be considered one of the great stand up comics. Uh, and all the other things that kind of come around it are just, uh, beneficial to my stand of career being so potent. So how how many hours? So you say you try to write every day. You try to get on stage every day. Yes. What does writing look like for you? Um, so my writing process is like a little chaotic. I don't think a lot of people write like this. But I will uh, open. Uh, I have this folder on my phone, both in TikTok and in Instagram, called the best. And in the best folder are like a bunch of videos and memes and stuff that have made me laugh. I'll set a timer for 10 minutes and I'll sit there and I'll watch those for 10 minutes. Um, Cause that gets me in a state where I'm laughing and having a good time. And then when I'm in that like really happy jovial state of like laughing out loud, I then switch over to writing and then I'll write for an hour. And so I'll set a time for an hour, turn my phone on airplane mode. And it's literally me, like I'll have some ideas written down and I'll look at like, okay, like uh, right now I'm trying to work on a joke about Genghis Khan. So pull up the Genghis Khan joke in my phone and then walk around my apartment talking out loud to myself like all oh, this. And like, I'm actually on stage and the tone and mannerisms and everything. So I'm like embodying what I do. And then when something hits, when I start making myself laugh with what I'm coming up with in, in jokes, then you go back to the phone, write that stuff down quickly, and then try to springboard off of that and keep that going for as long as possible. Um, that's my whole writing process. How long does it take you to come up with a joke on average? Oh, it's so hit and miss, man. Sometimes you get a joke that like, you come up with something and then you try it out and then it doesn't work, but like maybe like 50, 30 to 50% work. So you like take it back to the drawing board and you tinker it. My favorite part of stand up is the tinkering. Like, okay, this didn't work, but this and this works. So then you take those parts that didn't work and you go through the same process, watch the funny stuff, write for an hour, go back, tinker, 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 do that again, do that again, do that again. And then till you have multiple pieces that work. The best feeling in stand up for me is when you have like a new 10 minutes that is kind of has some moments and other parts are rough and other parts are good. And it's like up and down and you spend like however long, sometimes it could be two weeks. Sometimes it could be a month and you're tinkering each part. And maybe you take out a joke, this doesn't work. And you put another joke and it works. Uh, and then you have, then the whole 10 minutes, like, congeals and comes together and every bit's working and then you have probably about a week straight maybe four days where you can do that set over and over and over and you have no guilt because it's newly working so you still got to try it in its in its uh, ultimate form and it kills and then once you do it for too long you start to feel guilty for doing jokes that you know that work and you're not working on anything new and you have to go back to the stuff that is rocky and start having rockier sets again and build up um so how the back to the original question of how long it takes to write a joke it's completely random sometimes the first time you say something it's funny from day one some jokes i've had jokes that have taken like six months because you work on them for a bit they're going nowhere and I call it putting it on ice. You put a joke on ice, you stop working on it, you stop performing it. And then sometimes when I'm stuck in my writing, I'll scroll back in my phone to see what are the old notes of stuff I was working on. You go, oh, this idea, you pull it out again. Because that once you haven't looked at something for a few months, you forgot what direction you were trying to shove the joke in. So then you have an open mind of where you could potentially take the premise. And then you can, and then sometimes the you had a base that was good but the rest built on top of it wasn't good now you've scrapped the top and now you're building on it again and it builds in a great direction and then maybe stops at a certain point and then you go through that process again this is so, very involved oh yeah you live and breathe and are a part of your jokes they're like an extension of yourself and your opinions and your ideas and your thought process and what you find funny the and, and this is standard like most comedians will work this hard I don't know if most will work this hard. I think a lot. I think anyone who you see who you think is funny and has like, a, if you watch someone and they can make you laugh repeatedly on stage for an hour, 
I would think yes. I don't know if they would describe it in the same way. Um, I don't necessarily always have the, we talk about comedy a lot, but the, you don't want to get too self-indulgent with your uh, process with other comics um, because it can kind of sound like you're up your own butt. Uh, but it is like it, you, you're living and breathing and feeding yourself off of your ideas, just your ideas, literally just talking your, your nothing's even tactile. I don't have to like build a thing and then sell it. Like I have to sell you reacting how you have a, an internal involuntary laughter response to what I thought of in my head and said to you. And that is a very intimate connection to something. Hmm. Um, yeah. And that's just the, that's the process over and over and over again. And I think there's a lot of self discovery in that because in, at least for me to get better at this, I remember when I switched from basically writing like call and response jokes, I would say the first like six or seven years of me doing stand up was all call and response. Like what I know if I I, I say this to an audience, they laugh, and I can repeat that process over and over again. Um, it, at like, yeah, like the seven year mark, I started writing material that I honestly found funny, that I, I could now take what I found funny and translate that to a crowd. Like sometimes you'll see newer comics try something really edgy and they'll be like, oh, you can't handle this because the audience re responds poorly. And it, what it is, it's like, no, you haven't done the work to translate your sense of humor to the audience. And your sense of humor you know, is it. What's Sorry, hilarious about that is that's also what therapists do. So if oh, therapists yeah. like say something and it doesn't sit well with a patient, they're like, oh, you can't handle it. Yeah. And, you, right? that's, and that's and, not. And they don't do the work of translating or even workshopping their ideas. They're just convinced that the patient is in denial. It's your job to make that person accept it or laugh to it or take the the like the work that you're giving them to better themselves that is your job as the therapist or as the entertainer it's not the audience job to eat whatever slop you throw at them um like they bought tickets they spent money some of the therapists that i've known are, are like that though they're like yeah no yeah. like if you're not enjoying the slop it's like a problem on your end yeah it's like no no no, no. you especially in therapy you're supposed to you're supposed to help this person grow and 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 the way the way for them to grow is to understand that i'm right Jay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> right uh and but we i you see a lot of comics struggle with that and it's like they haven't done the work to you know, make that translation hearing you do this i, I i'm i'm very tempted to try stand up myself give it a shot just, i just because i thought it was i mean i knew i know it's hard mm -hmm. obviously because it's not you know it's got to be hard, but I'm I want to I want to get destroyed on yeah. stage just once, just I to mean, see what it's like. Audiences now are pretty savvy and pretty gen generous, and it depends on where you go. Some places are like way less forgiving, um, but for the most part, if you go out and you do a show and you write your five minutes and you go out and try it out, you'll only be destroyed by like deafening silence if it goes really poorly but definitely in the context of a show where it's like these comics are doing are new and they're trying it out for the first few times you get a lot more of a generous crowd which can be great it's a great motivator um but i always encourage everyone who wants to try it to try it there's no barrier to entry it literally if you can write words down on a piece of paper and speak into a microphone and some people can't even do that perfectly and they're still very very successful comedians um and then you should give it a shot. If you don't like it, then anyone who is doing stand-up, I know some people who are like doing it because they think it'll turn into something, which maybe it will, but they don't enjoy doing it. I can't imagine a worse hell because a lot of it sucks. A lot of it, it's like you're in stinky bars around Surly's. Uh, around what? Surly's, like uh, you're at a bar and there's like drunk Surly's, like bar flies. Um, like they're and, Surly? Like yeah, grumpy? Yeah, yeah. Like grumpy old dudes who like go to a place and drink for that's their thing. Um, and you you have to like enjoy that whole process before it starts to get like a little bit more glitz and glam. And then even when it gets get glitz and glam, there's a lot of grinding and flying and uh, but taking pictures for hours with people, um, which I enjoyed this entire process. And if I didn't, that would be hell on earth. 
Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because you, you talk about how hard it is. And I'm, I'm kind of like, so Che, I'm a little bit skeptical isn't the right word. I, I think you're, you're very authentic, but I just don't think a lot of what you talk about translates to normal human beings. No, I think um, a people, a lot of people describe me as like their inside voice. Like I say things that people think, and I, that's not my intention. I'll be like, oh, I'm saying what no one else will. And that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm very honest about my opinions about certain things. No, I mean, uh, but that that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like, it's not the opinions themselves. It's like, so, so like as a kid, your parents are like, children will make fun of you unless you stop sucking on your finger yeah and you're like eh yeah it'll I, hurt it'll mess it'll, up your teeth you're like eh yeah right and then and you're talking about going out there and just doing it and like sort of you know accepting death and like these are these are like big things man mm -hmm. like death is scary for most human beings yeah and like i'm gonna go do muay thai i'm gonna go up on stage I'm a bomb in front of people. Failure is a part of life. Like you're, you're kind of like, you know, Chad moding it. Just like, like even as a kid, you're like, eh, who cares what people think? And, and I, I get that you, you, you speak very authentic. I mean, like, I think you're genuine. I don't, I don't think we're getting any bullshit, but I'm just like, dude, like most people like avoid pain. You don't seem to give a shit. Um, I think part of it is my constitution. Like I, part of the rationalizing i'm like well if i go on stage and it goes bad that's fine like nothing really bad comes of that like i'm not going to lose a limb and have to uh, walk with a prosthetic forever like nothing really bad comes from that the going to muay thai class i know i'm going to start at a beginner level and i'm going to move up and there might be some classes that are harder than others do you feel bad when you're at beginner level no no because everyone starts at beginner level Everyone has to begin at something. There's a guy in the class who's 50 who's been doing it for like, I want to say like uh, between five and 10 years. That means he started when he was like 40. And the guy's incredible. He's hit super hard. He's in, in incredible shape. Like, um, But he, he had to be a brand new guy at 40. Uh, so it's like... Dude, so sorry, here's, here, here's the thing. I, I, I Have you always been like that? Um... Yeah, like I said, I've always been very rational and grounded. And I think you, I've definitely one of the, I think this also comes with we're going back to what we we're talking about before the relationship with my mom. My mom was very much keeping up appearances and worrying about what other people thought about her. And I've turned, tried to turn out of that real hard is like, don't care what other people think about you at all. At all. For one, you have no idea what other people think about you. So stressing over that is like, pointless and if people think negative things about you people will think negative people the ultra super the most successful famous people in the world like richest like people who we essentially aspire to be like not everyone but some of us they are the most scrutinized people publicly so it's like you can't control any of that stuff um and i try to find humor in it so i think that's where it comes from. It's like trying to get away from that keeping up appearances um, because I think it adds no value to life um, and trying to do what I want to do and have fun with that. And yeah, knowing that you're going to suck at almost everything the first time you do it, but enjoying that process. Like there's certain things on my bucket list that I'm like, I know I'm going to suck, but I want to get good. Um, like I love video games and uh i want to get really good at a video game before i die uh and i'm, not, I'm like oh, i i decided like any like twitch shooter that's done i'm too old for that like i can't i don't have the reaction time for it so like i need something strategy based so i'm gonna go with pokemon i, mean, I just got i got the new pokemon i'm gonna start my pokemon journey learning about all the different types and everything it's all a strategy based game so if i put in enough work and learn enough about the platform which it will be a lot of work but if I enjoy the process of learning all that I, and it's great. And then I get to that goal, it's going to be a whole experience and a whole different road and a whole new community and different people to relate to on different things. Uh, and then different experience to have in life that keeps life fun and fruitful and exciting. Can we go back to the 50 year old dude who's good at Muay Thai? Yeah. I feel like the average experience of, let's say, I don't know how old you are, but let's say people 
our age and I'm probably a little bit older than you. And then even like younger, like let's say I'm like 25 and I'm going to like, I'm going to listen. I'm, I'm a faithful follower of the gospel of Che. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go out and I'm a live life, right? Yeah. Because death is inevitable and you got to seize the day. Carpe mm -hmm. diem. I'm going to go to a, a class. I'm going to go to Muay Thai because I'm going to be something. I'm, yeah. I'm going to learn how to defend myself. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to get my ass kicked by a 50-year-old dude. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, that sucks. This guy is 50. <laughs> and well, I'm getting my ass beat. And and then I ask, I was like, oh, did you like learn when you were a kid? And he's like, nah, yeah. I, I, I'm relatively new. I started when I was 40. And then you're like, well, fuck. I guess I ain't going back. Well, I think part of going through these experiences is to do them intelligently as well. Like you don't just go into like or martial arts in general. Uh, when I found the gym that I'm training at, I tried a couple gyms before and they weren't bad in terms of like, oh, they, the trainers were too aggressive and I didn't feel safe. That's a very important part of martial arts is you want to go to a place where you feel safe. But I felt like they were more workout classes. Uh, and I wasn't, no one was really coming up to me and being like, oh, you're not kicking right. You're not doing this right. And I, that's what I wanted. I wanted, if I'm having not as good of a workout, but I wanted to learn how to do the things properly. So do like take the steps to make sure you learn stuff. Sit down with people. Um, Jay, yeah, can, I, take... can I jump in for a second? And, and yeah. sorry, sorry if this is, um, I, I don't think you, you understood what I said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Right. Like it seems like it completely went over you that like people are like people feel bad like that, oh, just, that. You know, well, I guess if something makes you feel bad, it's like at least you you tried it. Like if you went to what, the class what, and you, what do you do when you feel bad? When I feel bad, um, sometimes I do just watch funny videos on the Internet and they make me feel good. <laughs> like and then I, you're just done and you just get you can just go back to. I'm very fortunate that I've never battled with depression. So I am a very unique case on that. I'm very anxiety sometimes. Sometimes I feel very anxious about stuff like, cause I do pile on too much work and stuff sometimes. So it's like getting those things done, taking a breather. Um, but yeah, I guess if something makes you upset, then try to avoid doing it. But the whole point point of me doing Muay Thai was to feel good and feel excited to go to class and and so find things that make you feel excited um I in order whenever I feel maybe like I don't know like I need more I start comparing myself to my peers and I start to feel like I'm not accomplishing enough I look at the people who I started with in stand-up and I've surpassed many of them uh and I'm like I could still be there uh and then I also look at I, this is maybe a little bit morbid, but I think about how fortunate I, I am just to like be born in Canada and opposed to a place where I could have trouble finding clean drinking water or I could have been uh, uh, kidnapped or, or uh, it, all these different things that happen to millions of people around the world. Uh, I am not experiencing it. So I try to be very grateful for having just these things I take for granted every day. Um, and that helps me get grounded and feel just like rationalize my situation and just be like, yeah, no, things are going pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, that's really interesting because, because I, I, I think you have a couple of interesting cognitive tricks because I'm trying to understand like how you are the way that you are. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, cause I, I think that there's a lot of good stuff that you say. I think the problem is that like most people just, it, it's almost like. it's it's like your mind is teflon like stuff just seems to bounce off i am very I, I there's a lot of stuff i can let go really easily um that's not how it is for most people man like i think most people like things affect them like if you go to muay thai and you bomb on stage and i'm sure that you know stand up and stuff has has made you quite resilient but i think there are a couple of like so what i'm trying to figure out is okay for, for this guy like what what's going on so you can say just do it everyone mm -hmm. says just do it everyone who does it says just do it mm -hmm. but the fucking problem is they don't know how they're able to just do it when the rest of the people are struggling to just do it right like yeah. there's there's no insight into like why it's easy for some and hard for others i and, think 
um i think the 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 turning out of the keeping up appearances like really trying to not worry about the the outside perception that has been a baseline of who i am i think has so, helped a lot yeah so i mean but i think that too is something that like you can say right and i'm with you but your ability to let go of appearances is in and of itself a just doing it i'm just gonna stop thinking about what people i'm gonna stop caring about what most people can't do that yeah and uh, and the, if i can just finish yeah, yeah. So, go ahead. so I, I think what's really interesting is you do one thing, and so I'm sort of I'm digging, right? Because what I'm mm -hmm. I'm sort of noticing is that on the one hand you're very inspiring, but on the other hand, like, I don't think most people can do what you do. And so then the question is how what is it that actually goes on under the hood that allows you to do these things? And yeah. I, I so I want to share one thing. So I thought this was really interesting, which is that when you find yourself comparing to people who are better than you you actually do this cognitive thing where you go back to people that you started with. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I think you're really good at that you sort of do, and I don't know if this is intentional or, or but I think this is more duplicatable is like gaining perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I've noticed this myself where I felt inferior when I was in high school. I felt inferior when I was in college. I felt inferior when I was studying to become a monk in India I didn't really feel inferior in med school. I certainly felt inferior in residency when I was training to be a psychiatrist. I felt inferior as a streamer. And then I kind of noticed that like what I'm constantly doing, I, I was in line with a co-intern of mine getting coffee at like 4.30 PM one day, like in the hospital. And I was like, holy shit, this guy is on a completely different level. But I'm not comparing myself to the people I'm not comparing myself to the people that made me feel inferior in high school. I'm not comparing mm -hmm. myself to people in college. I, so what happens is I'm constantly changing the goalposts on myself. Yes. And, and one of the things that I, I don't think that we really do, which is a really cool cognitive trick, is like anytime you're feeling inferior to really ask yourself, okay, like, do I keep on changing? Like, it's like I, I move from the amateur league to the pro league. But we never really stopped to acknowledge that I used to be an amateur. And even before yeah. I was in the amateur league, I was on varsity. And even before that, I was JV. And that if you really look at, like, if you really do fair comparisons, which is not what our mind does, we do really unfair comparisons. And that's also because I, I imagine when we make ourselves feel insecure, there's a part of us that wants to work harder, mm -hmm. right? Because that insecurity, okay, I want to be better. I want to be able to play in this league. And so people who have imposter syndrome are actually people who are the most successful. And the mm -hmm. reason is because they're feeling insecure and then they're like working really hard and then they rise and they rise and they rise and they're imposters. And so that cognitive piece, I think, is actually really important because I, I do think that what who you are, we can we can learn from. We can start to do some of the things that you do. But the life that you're describing is like is wild, dude, like going out and like hanging out in a cottage with 10 comedians and and, you know, like really enjoying life and traveling to Greece and and going up and doing stand up. And like it sounds amazing, but it sounds like you're just a different human. I I I being fully transparent, I have the same issue with the imposter syndrome. I think that's I think that's a, an important part of any creative is to have the doubt. Because doubt will, it helps you second guess and helps you tinker and helps you work a little harder. See, you just did it again. <laughs> did I? I don't know. What you don't even I, realize it. <laughs> no, I don't know what I did. Like, I'm like, it's good. It's good to, to. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have these problems. They're like good problems. They help me grow as a person <laughs> instead of being crushed by the weight of imposter syndrome, which is what happens to most people. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know any other way to look at it. Yeah, I, I could tell. And I, I mean, I hopefully this, you know, you're a comedian, so I can say this. I can see that you're completely clueless. Like, that's yeah. clear to me. <laughs> and I, I know I have friends who struggle with uh, emotional uh, and mental health things. And I'm very, very grateful that I don't in the same way. Um, uh, but it just has been, it's always been like that. I've always, one of the things I, I, someone asked me when I started doing stand up, they're like, were you scared about like doing bad? And I said, I think I was too stupid to know that it could go bad. I was just like, yeah, we fine. 
Like I just was like, yeah, I'll go do it. It'll be fine. And I just did it and it was fine. And then I just kept doing it. That was like kind of the, my thought process going into the first one. Yeah, dude. I, I, I think, I think everyone talks about like success stories and, and, you know, things like that is like stories of like perseverance and intelligence and innovation and creativity and, and, you know, like believing in yourself and, and I, I think the, the story of success I'm hearing from you, and I, I think it's fair to say you're, you know, you're, you're decently successful is, is, you know, the Che story is like how to be a quitter and how to be an idiot. Yeah. You know, it the, the real <laughs> formula to, to rising in life. One of my, one of my buddies, very smart guy. Um, he's very much like anti-work subreddit mentality. Like he's like, yeah, yeah I don't want to work. I don't, I think jobs suck, which I'm not completely off with that. I'm like into the whole standard idea of working in jobs. I don't think is the best mindset to have. Um, but one thing he says, he's like, cause there's this perception that the smarter you get, the harder it is to be happy. Um, like you start to see the whole world and like you you can't turn away from all these injustices that are going on constantly and he and what he says he's like maybe you're too stupid like you're so smart but too stupid to be happy like if you're so smart you should figure out how to be happy um which is a very ignorant way to look at happiness um but i think the rat it's the same thing as saying like what if it could go bad what if it can go good they're both the same sides of the same coin like Every, when you're having those negative thoughts of, oh, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this can go wrong, you can look at this can go right, this can go right, this can go right. You you can make a decision in that moment to turn the ship the other way, and you can use the negative thought as the trigger. Like a great trigger for like getting up and going to the gym is when, when you have that thought, I don't want to go to the gym, that's when you go to the gym. That's when you're like, I got to get up and do it right now. Using the 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 procrastination as the trigger for the getting the thing done that is a little mental trick that helps you get more stuff done and you feel good when you get the stuff done okay so first thing your friend is surprisingly correct so speaking of of you know there are studies that are done on suicidality and the greater your insight the more rapidly, the faster you learn how screwed you are when you get diagnosed with something bad, mm. the more likely you are to be suicidal. Mm. There's also studies that show that, so if you kind of think about depression and anxiety, so IQ is good at like understanding things and is powerful. Mm. The problem with a lot of things, like especially depression, is that depression hijacks your IQ. So like if you hate yourself and you're really fucking smart. If there's some kind of emotional driver that is controlling your IQ, then suddenly it's like you've got this really powerful weapon, but it's like pointed in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So there are even, we, we have a video about like, it's really interesting, but you can't like logic your way out of depression. And in fact, there's some data that actually, if you're smart, like you may be more prone to mental illness in some ways. Um, so even things like creative, like raw creativity, objective measures of creativity are higher in people with like bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Now, creative output is lower in people with bi bipolar disorder because they're not able to, you know, do this craft process kind of like, I mean, I have no idea if you're bipolar or not, but, it, you know, the, the craft process and, and sort of resulting in something is hard, but your friend is actually not wrong there. Um, and the other thing that I'm really curious about is like th this shit that you're talking about. Once again, I'm like, dude, I don't think that's how humans work. And I, which is like, I'm procrast. Like, I don't feel like going to the gym. Do you get that? Most people just don't go to the gym. I, that, I do. I, how did I you do, do that? What did you, how did you, what the fuck, man? Um, I don't know. I just like, you just use it as a, I have a buddy who put me onto it who was like, yeah, use that as a trigger. And I was like, okay, I'll try doing that. And it doesn't work 100% of the time, but I try to get it to work. So, so what, what happens there when you use it as a trigger? So like um, this morning, uh, I was like, you, uh, I wake up and I start checking my phone and then I tell myself, oh, before I go, I like to go for a walk first thing in the morning. It's like, before I go for a walk, maybe I'll just look for content to react to later so I can have an excuse to keep looking at my phone. And I was like, no, just go for a walk. And so I get up, I just like, and then also making those things comfortable. It's when I out, so I'll wear shorts and flip flops. And it's like, okay, it's like a less of a barrier to entry. Even if that small barrier is putting on your shoes, flip-flops are easier to put on now you're out 
walking, moving your body. And now I'm a step closer to going to the gym because going to the gym after a walk is nice because my body's nice and warmed up from moving around a bunch. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of it to get it going. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. And this is really great. Uh, Che, are are you, how are you feeling about this conversation, by the way? Great. Yeah. Am I, am I like moving in the wrong direction, throwing too many? Like, so can I grab water really quick? Yeah, sure. And I'm going to have to wrap in maybe about 10 minutes, but, but go grab water and I'll. Cool. Um, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, look, this, 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 this guy's been standing. Did you guys see that? That's insane. He's been standing this whole time. What the fuck? Okay. You've been standing. You're not sitting. I've been standing. Yeah, yeah, I'm standing. Yeah. I have like a, a standing desk. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, I have to do the shitting, you know? Yeah, I know. The sitting's great. I love yeah. the sitting. Um, so here's what I'm kind of noticing. So if you want to use procrastination as a trigger to action, mm-hmm. I think where you're starting is, first of all, being fully aware that, oh, crap. I want to procrastinate right now. Really just yep. acknowledging I do not want to do this. Mm-hmm. And in, so most of the time when we procrastinate, we don't realize that that thought is a trigger for a particular behavior. And once you realize that it is a trigger for a behavior, if you can catch it in the act, you can actually deviate away. And then mm-hmm. I think the second thing that you do is that you don't, Anytime you're feeling lazy, you don't try to force yourself to do the thing that you don't want to do. You just force yourself to do anything but sinking into the procrastination. Yeah. So if it's like, like, okay, I don't feel like going to the gym and I feel like pulling out my phone, I'm not going to pull out my phone, but I'm not going to go to the gym either. And this is where I think a lot of people trip up because they try to go like 100%. Mm-hmm. And I think what it's really interesting because you're like, okay, I'm just going to put on flip flops and I'm going to go for a walk because if I can dodge getting sucked into this, then going to the gym is easier. Yeah. And and so I think your story is one of being a quitter, being ignorant, and actually being a slacker because you don't yeah. try to go to the gym. You just put on flip flops and shorts and go for a walk. So catch it in the moment and do way less than what your target is. And I think the um, like the way I look at those things is I have I have like my what I call my dailies like I have five things I try to do every day which is um, I call it like education so when I walk I like listen to a podcast or have like an audio book or something going and then uh, I go to the gym write make content meditate those are like the five things to do every day so do get those things going one after the other and if you can get those done in succession then you're like you're on to a killer day and then if you get them all done then you look at the to-do list after that um but if every time i kind of knowing what i need to do every day if i start scrolling or doing something else i know i'm deviating from what i need to do so it's really easy to identify the procrastination um also you can do little things to make the jobs more fun like a thing that i made the gym a lot more fun was i have a podcast that i love listening to and i try to only listen to it when i go to the gym so now it's like I get excited to listen to my podcast because I'm at the gym. And so now I'm making the gym more fun. These are like little mental tricks. And you can also just do like fake it till you make it where when you have that thing of I don't want to go to the gym, you tell yourself in your brain, you go, no, I love the gym. I love it. It's great. And like that, even though it sounds so simplistic, it does help like this mental trick of like, no, I do. I like it. I like it. I get in shape. I like the feeling feeling in shape. I like working out. I like getting a sweat on. And you think of all the things you do really like about the gym because a lot of the time when you're procrastinating on, or at least for me, I find when I'm procrastinating on doing something, it's not so much that I don't like doing the thing. I don't like the feeling of doing something I'm required to do. I don't like that homework feeling that like I have to get this done. Like I procrastinate on writing all the time. And then every time I write. I'm like, I love writing. I love writing jokes. The feeling of coming up with a new joke is incredible. I love it. Like the gym, I can justify not liking a little bit more because there's times where you work out really hard and you feel like crap or you've injured yourself or whatever. But the writing is like almost 99% of the time I'm having a good time while I'm writing. Um, So yeah, so I I think. How, How do you get over that feeling of like requirement? Like that uh, homework feeling. I've never gotten over it. 
So, because I also think it's interesting that your dailies are not, is not your to-do list. Mm -mm. Well, dailies are just the requirements that you just have to get done every day, like brushing your teeth or something. Um, but uh, those, like that homework feeling of doing something, getting those things done, how I get over those, uh, I've never gone over that feeling, but I have learned to subside the feeling of homework. And usually it's just getting into the thing, like just doing the thing makes you feel better. Like going for the walk and then putting in the podcast and then sitting down to meditate, like doing, once you're doing the thing, you don't feel the mm -hmm. need to procrastinate in it yeah. as much. Yeah, once you're started, yeah. Yeah, so it, you really just have to go and do, and also just removing barriers to entry really helps. Like the gym I go to is, I don't know, like, two blocks from my front door. So I leave, I, I literally leave in my, I bring no bag, just my gym attire. And I walk straight into the gym and I walk straight to the thing I need to work on. I don't need to go to a locker and put my stuff in a locker and do these things. Like there's, I've removed a lot of barriers to me working out. And that makes it a lot easier. The writing, it's like, I don't need a notepad and a pen and blah, blah, blah. I need my phone and that's it. The meditation, I just need to sit down. Um, the walking, I just need to put shoes on and I can go. Um, the education, I've made it super simple where it's a podcast, it's an audio book, it's whatever. It's something I'm listening to. That makes it really easy. Um, what is it? Writing, exercise, uh, education, meditation. What's the last one? Creating content. Oh, and I just like creating content usually I save to the end because then I'm like chomping at the bit to look at my phone because I love looking at my phone. And then so you do that at the end of the day. So it's like, oh, and I finally get to look at my phone. And then I'm like scrolling, 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 scrolling. And then to help with that so I don't get too lost in it, I set timers. So I know I limit myself so I don't get caught in the procrastination of making an excuse that I'm trying to find the perfect video when really now I'm just mindlessly scrolling. That's really cool, Che. Um, I, I'm going to have to get going in about five minutes, 10 minutes or so, but do you have any questions for me or anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Um, I don't know, man. Uh, I've, of, of you well, for Twitch, uh, you can find me at little dinky news. We do a lot of, uh, gaming content and stuff. We react to a bunch of different things. We just watched the playstations or whatever press conference they just had. Hmm. So we were like a lot of gaming, uh, centric stuff. Uh, we play a lot of Fortnite been ripping that a lot recently. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think I have uh, anything else to, to throw in there. I think start small uh, and then grow. I've had a, oh, and uh, one thing I wanted to say was like, what helps with the knowing if you're procrastinating is like being really honest with yourself. Like when I go for a walk, sometimes I listen to nothing and I will just think about w like anything. I'll just let my mind run. And like, some, like I got on a tangent recently where like I, I don't like fashion. I've always kind of never been uh, subscribing to fashion. I was like, and I was like, why? Asking myself the question, why? Why? And like pulling that up. It's like, well, I feel like it doesn't add anything to a person. Well, why do I feel like, what do I feel like adds to a person? And like digging deeper and deeper. And that's a whole other thing. But that helps you get very honest with yourself of your likes and dislikes, which I think comedy has really helped. Because what comedy is like finding your voice is just um, finding your sense of humor. So I'm like super in tune with mm. one aspect of my life, which is like laughter and, and joy and enjoyment. And that has helped me understand all other things, very similar to the Book of Five Rings, where he's like, I mastered the skill of strategy and now I can learn all other skills. So if you get in tune with yourself on something, you can apply that process of getting in tune to learning other aspects of your life. Book of Five Rings is Musashi? Yes. That's cool. Good, good book. Yeah, it's been a while since I've read it. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much, Shay. So so uh, I know you're big on TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. You stream on Twitch. Yes. Anything live coming up or anywhere else that people can find you if they're... Yes, I'm going to be in Oklahoma in July, um, Michigan in August, Austin in September. And we're adding on a bunch of stuff now. It looks like St. Louis, uh, Wisconsin. Those are going to be added very quickly. We're kind of figuring out the pieces of what the next leg of road work is going to be going into the late summer, uh, fall into the winter. So once I know all that, all that will be announced, but that those states are pretty much confirmed right now. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, um, good luck to, to you on all of your endeavors. Um, I, I may try to come see you in Austin and, uh, you know, 
thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I, I think a very different conversation from what I was expecting because most of the comedians I've worked with are like train wrecks, like <laughs> for, from a mental health standpoint. But I, I really think it's amazing how you pivot so much um, sure. and, and, and how you kind of, you know, there's so many things that I, I think can wear us down or cause us to almost like crack under the pressure, but you seem to do a couple of things that can really help you like move in the right direction. And I think those are actually learnable. Um, little yeah. cognitive tricks, even this aspect of, you know, why asking yourself why all the way down to the center Learn about yourself yeah yeah um is, is a big part of it, kind of what we do in psychotherapy but I, I think a lot of it can be done internally as well yeah just um, on a walk so thank you so much for coming and good luck to you man thank you i appreciate you having me on yeah take care dude have a good one bye okay um i gotta x out of this all right so that's Che. Dude, what on earth? This guy is insane. Um, and his, you know, it's so interesting because I, I, I found myself judging him based on his comedy. I thought he was going to be like a degenerate. But he's like a Miyamoto Musashi Five Rings reading Mega Chad Teflon Buddha type human who uses procrastination as a trigger to motivation. Like what? Oh, yeah, we're talking about envy. We can do that. And then we'll wrap for the day. Okay. So. Let's talk about envy for a second. So there are a lot of emotions that we talk about, and we sort of, like, talk about how to deal with them, right? There's a lot of, like, stuff on, like, shame. Like, how do I overcome toxic shame? And, like, anger. Like, how do I learn to accept my anger, right? The one that we don't really talk about is envy. And envy is like, it's really crippling in a lot of ways. But it, the tricky thing is that envy can be good. So envy for a lot of people is fuel. Like, I want to be that person. And the tricky thing is that also when we talk about emotions, we talk about them generally. Like, okay, how do I get in touch with my emotions? How do I overcome my emotions? How do I allow space for my emotions, man? We don't think about them as discrete things that have discrete strategies to deal with. So there's this old text called the Vishuddha Maga, the path of purification, which is really cool because what they sort of realize is a, a, a text from the Buddhist tradition is that each emotion actually has a particular key that unlocks it. There's a particular way that you can take every emotion and transform it into something positive. So let's start by understanding what is envy. Envy is some amount of appreciation plus ego. So if you think about it, like what does that mean? You can't envy something unless you appreciate it. We don't envy bad things. We appreciate good things, right? Makes sense. Second thing is we don't appreciate all good things. I mean, so we don't envy all good things, right? So there's all kinds of people out there who have all kinds of good stuff, and we don't appreciate all of the good things. So envy, at its core, envy has a positive emotion there, which is appreciation. So if you appreciate a particular thing, that is what can lead to envy. But appreciation is a good thing, right? Like, to appreciate stuff is, like, good. Like, that's the point of life, and, like, I appreciate, like, it's good. So what is it that takes appreciation and turns it into the toxic emotion of envy? It is ego. So there's a really simple diagnostic trick that y'all can do. And that is the next time you envy, you feel envy, notice that the envy is directed towards a person. But you envy that person for a reason. Right? So if, if someone, let's say someone like is good looking, or I envy someone's physique or someone's success. I envy the person, but there is an attribute of that person that I appreciate. And what I really respect is that thing, but the second I, I make a comparison, the second I embody it with a person, that becomes ego, because I'm over here and this person is over here. And there are all kinds of things where we can see like the value of appreciation, where I can look at someone and I can be inspired by them Right. But when I get inspired by them, I'm not thinking about them. I'm thinking about me. 
I don't know if that sort of makes sense, but I say like, oh, wow, that person is, is, is really in shape or works really hard. I'm going to start doing that too. I can do that. And so the focus becomes on myself instead of the other person. That's the difference between inspiration and envy. But if we really look at like, where is, where are our eyes pointed? In envy, they are pointed at another human being and there is a comparison being made. And when I'm inspired by another person, my eyes are pointing at myself and there's no comparison. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to start doing this. And so how can you take envy and turn it into appreciation or inspiration? You have to remove the ego component. You must remove the comparative component because the appreciation is down there, right? Even the longing for the thing is down there. But this is what's kind of tricky is that envy can sort of like inspire us to act, but it does so like in sort of a polluting way, right? It's like there, it generates like this nuclear waste, like sure it powers our submarine, but we're like generating like nuclear waste as a result. So it hurts. And so what you really need to do is notice the next time you envy someone, ask yourself a couple of questions. One is, what do I appreciate about this? What is the thing that I'm actually attracted to? The second thing is, why do I compare myself to this person? Why is this, instead of being about the thing itself that I want to do, I'm putting my identity and their identity into it? And I'm drawing a comparison, and it is out of that comparison that the toxicity arises. So take, as you notice, like, I want to be this person, right? It's not that you want those things, which is what you tell yourself, but this is exactly why we sort of miss it. Because it's not really about the things. You can't envy, you can't envy a physique. You can want a physique, but you can envy a person. Because envy is person-centric. And so try to remove that from the equation. Notice, wow, like I'm drawing a comparison between me and them. And that comparison in turn has to do with your identity. So I feel a particular way about myself. And now we see why you're so far from the goal. Because the goal is the physique. This person has the physique. There's a comparison. The comparison, why, why do we compare things? We compare things because we ourselves are insecure about them. That's why we compare, right? And you may say, what, what, what do you mean by that? Let's just understand that for a second. If you're secure about something, like you don't notice it in other people, right? It's kind of com it's kind of weird, but it's like so simple and it's so automatic that we don't even realize it. That all of our comparisons are based on insecurities. And so now we can see that, okay, the root of envy is actually ego and ego is a defense mechanism against insecurity. So when do I fe feel egotistical? When someone threatens my intelligence and I'm afraid that maybe I'm not quite as smart as I think I am, and you can look at social media and certain famous people and you just can trigger them very easily. Because if you, you know, people who are confident, it's like, it doesn't really bother them to be criticized. But when we have an insecurity, and that's like, that's how like, kids learn how to make fun of you, right? Like they learn where the weak points are. And why do particular kids make fun in a particular way? It's because they sniff out the insecurity. How do they sniff out the insecurity? Because of the way that you react. So someone makes fun of you, a bully makes fun of you five different ways in five, uh, five different days in five different ways. And what do they do next week? Which name do they, they attach to you? And then everyone starts calling you that. It's the thing that you react to. So that insecurity... As we get older, we develop an ego to protect ourselves. I'm not stupid. You're stupid. This isn't my fault. This is your fault. I'm the smartest person on the planet. I'm the richest person on the planet. I'm so successful. Look at me. I'm a mega chat. I'm in shape. I make all, all this money. I date lots of these people. I have everyone lined up. Everyone wants a piece of me. All ego. And underneath, insecurity. So if you want to disable envy, notice your insecurity. Notice the comparison. And then gravitate towards the appreciation. Recognize that, wow, this is something that I want. And instead of envying that person and your eyes being over there and trying to duplicate them, notice what is beyond them. What is it that I'm truly appreciating? 
and then ask yourself, what can I do to get that thing that I appreciate? How can I actually move towards that? What's the smallest thing that I can do to move towards that which I appreciate? And something revolutionary will happen, which is that you'll start to move towards it. And you may say, but Dr. K, that's hard. I don't, I want all kinds of things and I don't move towards them. And the reason for that is because so much of your fucking cognition is caught up in envy. Where does the energy of envy get you? Nowhere. And it occupies your mind. It fills your mind. It's all of this insecurity, all of this ego, instead of actually moving towards anything that you want. And so once you remove all of this ego from the equation, you'll be able to actually move towards your goals. And if you pay attention to yourself, you'll find that the goals that are the hardest to achieve are the ones that have your ego involved. If you're not trying to impress anyone, you can hang out with them very easily. I can hang out with my dozen gaming buddies because I'm not trying to get any of them to fall in love with me. I'm just hanging out. But the second that my worth, I want to be accepted by this person. I don't want to be rejected. Ego enters the picture and all of our cognitive energy is like spiraling out of control in a completely unproductive way. And so as you dismantle envy and move towards appreciation, as you step away from ego and start thinking about what can I do? How can I take one step towards this thing? You will actually become like more motivated. You will start to accomplish more. And so practice understanding and catching envy and splitting it apart into appreciation and ego. And then step back from the ego and you'll start moving towards what you want. Make sense? Questions? Nicolette, I'm, I'm INTP. I'm certainly not a INTP. Myers-Briggs. Love it. Okay, this is beautiful. Great question. Spore Yosh is saying, what if envy comes from something that you think you cannot have, whether or not that's true? Brilliant question. What if envy comes from something you cannot have? There's the ego. It all, it's all, not always going to do that, but that is absolutely exactly what I'm talking about. Why can't you have it? Other people can have it, but you can't have it. That's ego. That's your identity. That's exactly, that's going to, you're spot on. That's where it's going to come from. But that's the whole point. That's how you have to disarm it because it's still the ego. Why can't you have it? And now this is where your mind will convince you. It'll come up with all of this logic and all of this data. I can't be happy because dot, 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 dot. But you can go on the internet and you can find a thousand people who are convinced that they cannot have something and you can recognize that they're wrong and you can argue with them until you're blue in the face and it's never going to make a difference. Because once you have an identity that you cannot have something, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's no way they'll hire me for this job. So you go into the job interview thinking there's no way they're going to hire you. You're dejected. You're not even going to try. You're certainly not excited. How on earth would you get excited? Instead, what you're doing is you're protecting yourself from the inevitable rejection. And if you're afraid that you can't have something and you don't deserve it because all of these logical reasons, how do you protect yourself? You protect yourself by preventing excitement, by preventing yourself from wanting it. And if you prevent excitement and prevent yourself from wanting it, you sabotage your ability to get it. Because when you go in for the job interview, do you want the job? No. I cannot... It hurts too much to think that I may want the job and not get it. The pain of an unfulfilled desire is too much for me to handle. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop wanting. 
And then your life becomes numb and empty. Because what do you do? I don't want anything. So I'm going to sit at home all day in front of a screen and maybe drink or get high from time to time. Beautiful question. Is the goal to completely get rid of your ego? Only if you want to become enlightened. So the goal depends on the goal. So for most human beings, what I would recommend is that you should be in control of your ego. The ego is not a bad thing. We've evolved it for a reason. The problem is that the ego controls us instead of the other way around. Right? So the goal is for you to understand when the ego is active and even let it act sometimes, but for you to be in control of it. So the ego is supposed to protect us. Like, I'm not egoless by any means. If someone tries to steal something that is mine, my ego will arise and I will let it arise. Right? So sometimes, like, it's kind of weird, but like, you know, let's say I'm in the emergency room doing like an emergency psychiatry shift and there's someone who's like calling me names. And like, that's when I let my ego come out and I say, hey, I'm here to help you. It's not okay for you to call me these things. I don't deserve to be called these things. I understand you're having a bad night. I'm here to help you. I'm working overnight and like, I'm not putting my kids to bed today to help your ass. And I'm going to help you either way. But the way that you're treating me is completely unacceptable. I'm here because of my ethical obligation. Like, I have an ethical obligation, which is, like, part of the reason I come here is to help assholes like you. But I would really appreciate it if you could treat me with some respect. And if you could stop being an asshole. Because we got to do this. Like, you're not leaving. And we have to figure this out. And I'm going to do my duty. But, like... It's, I'm going to do a way better job if you stop treating me like shit. And I'm on your side. The only person you're really hurting here is yourself. And you're like pulling me along on the pain train for no reason. Right? So ego is good. And sometimes so like it's a huge problem because when we, a lot of times when people are psychiatrically ill, their family members enable them so much, no one ever, ever actually sets boundaries on them. And it doesn't actually help them. Like I was working with someone once who had ADHD and they were in this relationship and like, you know, they had difficulty doing things because they have ADHD and like, that's fair, right? That's what we're here to help you with. But at the same time, like they have to do their part. Like it doesn't change the fact that in the relationship, their partner has to do everything because they're too disorganized. So now the partner is doing the work of two people. And is it the person with ADHD's fault that they have ADHD? Does it objectively make things harder? It's not their fault they have ADHD, and it's not, it, it does make things objectively harder, but who is it making it harder for? It makes it harder for everyone. And yet this person is not engaging in treatment. They're not using planners and organization and all this kind of stuff. So they're not accepting responsibility for the circumstance. Is your life hard? Yes. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working harder at it. Please do a video on your struggles. Day in the life. Okay. I will do those things. Yeah, you know, no, no saying a my cure for envy is fantasize having the thing in daydream until I can't no more. Ludwig does the same thing. We had a conversation with Ludwig where he was like, yeah, I just fantasize about it and then it kind of disappears. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Ah, how do you stop once you have to give in to your ego? What a great question. Last question, then I got to run. So you don't give in to your ego. Giving in to your ego is letting the dog off the leash. You don't give in to the ego. You just take it for a walk and you're still in control, but you don't let it off the leash. Giving in to your ego is a problem. It helps to mitigate the pain. Absolutely. That's the big tragedy in life, is that we are so stuck mitigating the pain of life that we can't move towards anything, right? And now the problem, see, see there's, a, there's a basic problem in, in society today, 
which is that in the past, if you had some sort of pain, that was a signal for you to change your life to fix the pain. So if we look at like animals, if an animal is hungry, there's only one thing an animal can do to get rid of that hunger. If we are socially ostracized as human beings, there it hurts a lot, but then that hurt motivates us to change our behavior and reintegrate into society. This is why we have forgiveness as a concept, because people feel bad. And even if you screw up, there's an avenue towards reintegration. Now the problem is that when we feel pain, you have a way to disarm that pain without actually making a change in your life. This. You can take the pain away without changing the circumstances that cause the pain. And this is how we get stuck. Because it used to be that, hey, like if I'm sitting and I'm uncomfortable, I have to move and then I will feel better. If I'm hungry, I have to eat. But when it comes to this psychic pain, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm a failure. I'm filled with envy. I'm angry. What do we do with those things? When you're angry, what do you do? You fucking, you downvote something instead of actually making a change in the world. And when you actually make a change in the world, you feel good about yourself and you help other human beings. But now because of this, we can make the pain go away without actually changing our circumstances. And then we end up stuck in life because we haven't built anything. And now we get stuck in this cycle of taking the pain away constantly. And so our life is not something that we live. It is a constant process of pain numbing. And it's because this has short-circuited why we have pain in the first place. Pain is a signal to change. We don't need to anymore. And this is why mental this is why we have a mental health crisis. Because no one has to fix their lives anymore. And just numb it so easily. Spectre Owl is right. It's like a pacifier. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. We got to run. Thank you all very much for coming. Che is a mega chat. Not what I was expecting, but that's what's fun about this. And I think what's really cool about like talking to people is that we can discover that. So this, this is the last thing I'll leave y'all with. Here's the last thing. We go through life and life is hard. The thing is, each and every one of us learns certain tricks to make life better or tolerable. But the problem is we never share our knowledge with each other. Because we don't even realize what we're doing. The automatic things that make you good at life, you're not even aware of. But the more that we talk to people, the more we're just going to discover different tricks. And I encourage y'all to pay attention to these conversations and think like, oh, this person is different. But like... Most people can become somewhat similar if they change the way that they act or the way that they think. If one person is in shape and you're not in shape, you can do that. And you can do that for the mind too. This is the big thing that we don't understand. This is what the yogis figured out is the path to enlightenment is like something that anyone can walk. That's what meditation is. And so if you want to figure out how to live life, listen to conversations with other people. And try to figure out how is this person able to do this? And what part of this can I duplicate? Because each and every one of this, what I've seen is like every patient I've worked with will figure out some things on their own. And if we pull all that knowledge together, we can literally craft a life that is like perfect. And you can say, oh, Dr. K, like you can't say that there's such a thing as perfect life. Like, oh my God. No, like what the fuck? Where did we get off on the idea that we can cra can't craft a perfect life? Well, because we haven't been able to. That's because we haven't been working together. And if we work together, I think we can get pretty damn close. So stay, stick with it. Good luck. And thanks for showing up today.
Adios, everybody.